Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we are now beginning a whole new series on the book of Isaiah. Many of you will know that there's lots of challenging and interesting things to study in the book of Isaiah, so here we go. Join us. This first lesson for January 2 of 2021 is entitled Crisis of Identity, and I think you'll understand why that is as we study this lesson together. Shall we begin with a word of prayer? Our wonderful Father, we have come once again recognizing your presence among us and thanking you for the privilege we have of studying your word. Be close to us and all those who will be listening in as we consider these things together, how we can lead others to understand you better, all of us together may one day soon join you in the kingdom of heaven is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In case you weren't familiar with the history, Isaiah lived in a very tumultuous time in Bible history. During his ministry in the southern kingdom of Judah, their northern brothers of the kingdom of Israel were invaded, conquered, and scattered to the winds uh, by, the, by the Assyrians, never to be heard from again. That was in 722, 720, 723, 722 BC. Remember, we're counting down. The Assyrians also invaded Judah in 701 BC, and it seems there was no possibility that the same fate would not overcome Judah until Hezekiah and Isaiah led the people to turn to God. What a revolutionary thought, huh? After the Assyrians blasphemed the name of God in Isaiah 36 and 2 Kings 18, you can read about it there. Those are duplicate chapters, by the way. God destroyed 185,000 men of their army without the people of Judah fighting at all. And you can read about that in 2 Kings 19, verse 35, or Isaiah 37, verse 36. This completely changed the course of human history as the Assyrians, with their capital at Nineveh, at that point were the most powerful nation in the world. Isaiah was a member of the royal household, that is, a member of the royal family, and was called as a prophet while still quite young. You can read about that in Volume 5 of the Testimonies by Ellen White on page 749. Somewhere between the years of 750 and 739 B.C., his work extended for 60 years during the reigns of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Isaiah was put into a hollow log and sawn in two by King Manasseh, very early in Manasseh's reign, probably around 686 B.C. And you can read a little bit about that in 2 Kings 21, 16, and Hebrews 11, 37. Or did he hide there? Yeah, that's actually true. Uh, they, he hid in the, in the what, this is what the Apocrypha says, uh, actually the Pseudepigrapha says, that he hid in a tree, but unfortunately he didn't quite get all of his, his um, coattails hidden in there, so someone came along and saw the piece of his coattails hanging out from this hollow tree, and so they grabbed the tree. I don't know if they cut the tree down or what, but he was still in there, and they sawed him a half right in the tree. I mean, imagine doing that. Mm. Yeah. And he was probably about my age when that <laughs> happened to him, 70, 80, somewhere in there. Well, going back to his mission now, if you were a new prophet, think about this, if you were a new prophet and were given a commission by God to carry a message to the people of Jerusalem, would you start out by telling them that they were more dumb than cows or even donkeys? Jim? Isaiah 1, 1 to 9. This book contains messages about Judah and Jerusalem, which God revealed to Isaiah, son of Amos, during the time when Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah. The Lord said, Earth and sky, listen to what I am saying. The children I brought up have rebelled against me. Cattle know who owns them, and donkeys know where their master feeds them. But that is more but that is more than my people Israel know they don't understand at all. You are doomed, you are a sinful nation, you corrupt an evil people, your sins drag you down, you have rejected the Lord, the holy God of Israel, and have turned your backs on him. 
Why do you keep on rebelling? Do you want to be punished even more? Israel, your head is already covered with wounds, and your heart and mind are sick. From head to foot, there is not a healthy spot on your body. You are covered with bruises and sores and open wounds. Your wounds have not been cleaned or bandaged. No ointment has been put on them. Your country has even excuse me, has been devastated and your cities have been burnt to the ground. While, excuse me, while you look on, foreigners take over your land and bring everything to ruin. Jerusalem alone is left, a city under siege, as defenseless as a guard's hut in a vineyard or a shed in a cucumber field. <laughs> if the Lord Almighty had not seen, excuse me, had not let some of the people survive, Jerusalem would have been totally destroyed, just as Sodom and Gomorrah were. American Bible Society, 1992. You know, that is somewhat parallel to Ezekiel 16. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and talking about the total destruction. I'm reading a book about the uh, uh, lost uh, temples in Jerusalem by the fellow by the name of Ernest Martin. You recognize mm -hmm. that name. I'll, I'll, I, I, PDF. It's not available. But anyway, uh, this business of where the Temple Mount is mm. and how they... See, the temple crashed down and uh, they scraped all that to get that gold. Yeah, exactly. Okay? It was not. It was down at the uh, um, city of David is where that was. Not up there on what would traditionally is called Temple Mount. But this this destruction, that's a f precursor to what uh, Jesus yep. did in, in Matthew. Yeah. So, what was the context in which Isaiah was making these statements on behalf of God? And now you're going to read an absolutely incredible passage that everybody who studies the book of Isaiah should, in fact, anybody who studies the Old Testament and wonders what happened to the people of Israel need to read this probably repeatedly and keep this clearly in mind. So, Carrie, do it for us. All right. I'm reading from 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 7 through 20. Samaria fell because the Israelites sinned against the Lord their God who had rescued them from the king of Egypt and had led them out of Egypt. They worshipped other gods, followed the customs of the people whom the Lord had driven out as his people advanced, and adopted customs introduced by the kings of Israel. The Israelites did things that the Lord their God disapproved of. I want you to let me interrupt for just a second. I want you to think about this list of, of things they did that they were not supposed to do. They built pagan places of worship in all their towns, from the smallest village to the largest city. On all the hills and under every shady tree, they put up stone pillars and images of the goddess Asherah. And they burned incense on all the pagan altars, following the practice of the people whom the Lord had driven out of the land. They aroused the Lord's anger with all their wicked deeds and disobeyed the Lord's command not to worship idols. The Lord had sent his messengers and prophets to warn Israel and Judah, Abandon your evil ways and obey my commands, which are contained in the law I gave to your ancestors and which I handed on to you through my servants, the prophets. But they would not obey. They were stubborn like their ancestors who had not trusted in the Lord their God. They refused to obey his instructions. They did not keep the covenant he had made with their ancestors, and they disregarded his warnings. They worshipped worthless idols and became worthless themselves. I want you to th look at those very key words. They worshipped worthless idols and became worthless themselves. Yeah. And they followed the customs of the surrounding nations, disobeying the Lord's command not to imitate them. They broke all the laws of the Lord their God and made two metal bull calves to worship. They also made an image of the goddess Asherah, worshipped the stars and served the god Baal. They sacrificed their sons and daughters as burnt offerings to pagan gods. Think about that. Yes, terrible, huh? They consulted mediums and fortune tellers and they devoted themselves completely to doing what is wrong in the Lord's sight and so aroused his anger. 
the Lord was angry with the Israelites and banished them from his sight, leaving only the kingdom of Judah. But here's, even, the, here's the part that's relevant to our study for Isaiah. Isaiah. Go ahead. Okay. But even the people of Judah did not obey the laws of the Lord their God. They imitated the customs adopted by the people of Israel. The Lord rejected all the Israelites, punishing them and handing them over to cruel enemies until at last he had banished them from his sight. Wow. So he was angry, and what did he do? He handed them over to their enemies. Yes. Yeah. Caution. Yes. We, we are pretty cool Seventh-day Adventists all over the world. We keep the Sabbath, the Ten Commandments, we teach Sabbath school classes, we pay tithes and offerings. We must be pretty cool, huh? Yeah, right. And the Lord says, I'm going to spew you out, out of my mouth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Isaiah started out reminding the people that they had rebelled against God. They had shown their ignorance of God. Foreigners had taken over their territory. They ignored God's instructions and did what they pleased, following the customs of the nations that God told them to drive out when they arrived from Egypt. Mm. Wow. Well, it should be clear that Isaiah was addressing the people of Jerusalem. I mean, that's about the only, the only thing that was left of the, of the country of Judah at that point in time. So why did he start out with, Hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth? Isaiah 1, 2. Well, when they made political agreements with a lesser ruler, ancient Near Eastern kings, such as Hittite emperors, would invoke their gods, their lesser gods, as witness to, witnesses to emphasize that any violation of the agreement they were making would surely be noticed and punished. By contrast, the true God, the only real God, cannot call on lesser gods as witness because there aren't any lesser gods, so he called on heaven and earth, and that's repeated in a number of places. One very, very particular interesting place is Deuteronomy 4, 26. Let's just look at that for a moment so you'll see here. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that if you disobey me, you will soon disappear from the land. You will not live very long in the land across Jordan that you're about to occupy. You will be completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's not very friendly, is it? Having suggested that his people were less intelligent than oxygen, oxen and donkeys, he then moved on to comparing them to the rulers of Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, <clears throat> Charles? Yeah, Isaiah 1, 10 through 17. Jerusalem, your rulers and your people are like those of Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen to what the Lord is saying to you. Pay attention to what our God is teaching you. He says, Do you think I want all these sacrifices you keep offering to me? Have it more than enough of the sheep you burn as sacrifices on the fat of your fine animals. I'm going to interrupt now for just a moment. Why would God ever want burnt animals as sacrifices. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? If you go past the place where they actually do that. I, we lived for many years in, in Tanzania. And we had a church located at the school where we taught, and where I, which was our, where our home was located. But there was fairly often, we would visit another church down in the town uh, the, the city of Arusha, a little ways away. And so that would mean that Sabbath morning, a little while before Sabbath school would, time would start, we would be driving down the road and off toward Arusha. And there was a butcher yeah. that was on the road, and he had a big cement slab out in front of his place there, right beside the road. And just about the time we would come along, mm -hmm. here would be some animal struggling up by his feet, and he's whacking him a part and pieces and my children thought you know it, it, you know <laughs> just, I mean and you would wonder why why would anyone you know of course there's blood spreading all over the place and so forth why would God want that yeah yeah well here's the place where he says he didn't want that 
Yes. Um, I am tired. I'm tired of the blood of the bulls and the sheep and the goats. Who asked you to bring me all this when you come to worship me? Who asked you to do all this trampling about in my temple? Hmm. It's useless to bring your offerings. I am disgusted, disgusted with the smell of the license of you burn, incense okay. you burn. Now let's, let's be honest. Probably everything they did there was following some guideline that God had given them back in the days of Moses, right? Yes. Yeah. Pretty sure. So what's happened? He's saying, you know, I'm disgusted, I don't like it, I'm not happy with this one tiny little bit. He's going to say, I can't stand you, it's new moons and so forth, all this kind of... I mean, all of that was stuff he told them to do. So what's happened here? They, they made this worship itself not what it represented. I believe that was the problem. They, they believed that this was going to this was basically it. earn them a ways to heaven. Just right. follow, ritualistically it's follow right. this these rules that God... Totally pagan, Yeah, what they were doing. They were just thought they'd, they'd do something to please the deity and, and that would get him off their back. Yeah. Well, the only thing for quite some time was that they were not offering uh, their children yeah, to well, pagans. But then they he, he, adopted they that. that well. yeah. Who was Uzziah? Or, uh, someone, Menasseh or someone? Well, uh, the first one who did it that we, that we have a record of was Solomon. Yeah. Solomon actually offered his children. The wisest man, come on. Yeah. Became and then, one of the most perverse there was. I mean, yeah. if, you, if you want to look at uh, occult, uh, occult uh, book sections of, of uh, bookstores, whole raft of material there about uh, Solomon. He's, he's really a very, not a good guy. Yeah. Right, right. Well, we... We're reasonably sure he's going to be in heaven after all that. Well, he, you know, yeah. that's, that shows how gracious God is. Yeah, Amen. exactly. God, God is merciful. Amen. Okay? The opposite, the extreme of, of, of what this pagan stuff is. Yeah. So let's be clear about all those sacrifices. When was that first, when was the first sacrifice offered? Well, the first one really truly was someone who lost his life for that. Uh, it was Abel. Abel. Yeah, well... And that wasn't a sacrifice, that was a, that was a murder. No, well, you know, even before that, even before that there were sacrifices offered, because he himself was offering sacrifices. When was the very first sacrifice offered as a... Well, it was Jesus, really. He, no? Well, no. you mean talking about his guiding? Right, that he was... Who did it? Who did it and where? We know exactly. Adam and Eve were the first ones to offer the sacrifices under God's guidance, just outside the That's gate why. of Eden. Eden. Okay. That's where it started. And what was God trying to tell them? He was trying to show them that sin leads to death. And if you stop and think about it, the t those animals that died right there outside of the gate of the Garden of Eden were probably the very first deaths in the history of the universe. Yeah. Of anything. Then we used to, in the 80s, 70s, imparted righteousness. Yeah. Probably bigger animals too. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Took the, sh the skin and put it on there. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. There's lots of questions. Anyway, go ahead. I, I cannot, cannot stand your new moon festivals, your Sabbaths. Oh, wow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I cannot stand your Sabbaths and your religious gathering. They are all corrupted by your sins. That's the problem. Yeah. Corrupted by your sins. I hate your new moon festivals, the holy days. They are a burden that I am tired of bearing. When you lift your hands in prayer, I will not look at you. Wow. No matter how much you pray, I will not listen, for your hands are covered with blood. Mm. Wash yourselves clean. Stop all this evil that I see in you doing. You stop doing evil and learn to do right. See that justice is done. Help those who are oppressed. Give orphans their rights 
and defend the widows. Wow. Wow. Okay. I mean, just... I'm trying to imagine a parent giving a message, something like that, to their children. Yeah. Just... God was trying to get them to understand that if their religion did not affect the way they lived each day during the week, it was useless. Mm. They were actually abusing orphans and widows and thus showing contempt for God himself. I cannot help it, but isn't that what Peter, I think, says the best religion is have love the orphans, love the widows. Yep. While it is true that God had instituted a ritual worship system to teach them that sin leads to death, remember that the first lambs were sacrificed outside the garden of the gate of the Garden of Eden, which, as far as we know, were the first deaths in the universe. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, all these sacrifices are detailed in, in considerable detail. Leviticus chapters 1 through 16, 16 ending up with the, the Day of Atonement. God had chosen the temple built by Solomon in Jerusalem as the only place where they were to go to offer their sacrifices. And where do we find that? 1 Kings 8, 10 and 11, as the priests were leaving. Well, and now let's talk, let's talk about that temple that he was saying that was so perverse and so corrupted now. How did it get started? 1 Kings 8, 10 and 11, this is the dedication of Solomon's temple. As the priests were leaving the temple, it was suddenly filled with a cloud shining with the dazzling light of the Lord's presence. And they could not go back in. The priests could not go back in to perform their duties. I mean, imagine in our day dedicating a church yeah. and suddenly God's presence, dazzling light of God's presence fills the church and you can't even go in. Yeah. And it happened one time earlier, as we'll find out later. Imagine having God recognize the dedication of a new church with such an appearance. And so God said, Jim? Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. Wash yourselves clean. Stop all this evil that I see you doing. Yes, stop doing evil and learn to do right. See what justice is doing. Excuse me. See that justice is done. Help those who are oppressed, give orphans their rights, and defend widows. So what did God suggest as the answer to all these problems? Carrie? I'm reading from Isaiah 1, verse 18. The Lord says, Now let's settle the matter. You are stained red with sin, but I will wash you as clean as snow. Although your stains are deep red, you will be as white as wool. That's from the Good News Bible. Well, the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Assyrians and overrun. The people who lived there were scattered to the winds in the middle of Isaiah's prophetic ministry. Shouldn't that have been adequate warning to the people of Judea? Yet God offered to work things out with them. Now I want you to understand, if you haven't been to, to Israel and you don't understand the, the geography really well, the northern kingdom of Assyria. I mean, the kingdom had, or the kingdom of Assyria had conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. It's almost wrapped around Jerusalem. I mean, their enemies were, you know, five miles away, kind of thing. And you, you would have sort of thought, well, hmm, I wonder if that's a hint. <laughs> you know, wow. Shouldn't that have been adequate warning to the people of Judah? Yet God offered to work things out with them. Why would God say, come and let's discuss this? That's basically what he's saying in Isaiah 118. Why didn't God just say, do what you're told? Or, or did he say that? He says you don't listen. So many places in the old days, you don't, you don't listen. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So what were the children of Israel supposed to learn from the sacrificial system? We got a whole Old Testament that talks about it. So the wages of sin is death, and there the wages of sin is death, <clears throat> for sure. Sin pays its wage. Death, yeah. Death. Would it be correct to say, in light of what what we have here in the first chapter of Isaiah, if you are not thinking, 
You're not worshiping? Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, uh, I grew up with people who uh, use the beards and how many times. You would. And also Catholic Church the same way. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. You, you do the it becomes ritual. Yeah. Uh, I, I, when you mentioned that, I think about the time we had on our way home from Africa, having spent four years in, in Zambia, we uh, tried to vi visit several countries in the Middle East. I mean, we're, we're going there anyway, why not? You know, somebody else is paying the bill yeah. for us to get home, so why not visit some places? So we spent one day in, in Istanbul, Turkey. Mm -hmm. And the, the airport's a little ways out of the town, it's not too far, but, and there's a f fairly nice road out there and they, what do they call those beads they use? Um, I forgot. They're, the Muslims. Yeah, they're the beads. Yeah, but what are they? Similar to a, Catholics use a rosary. Yeah, yeah. They, they have a special name for them. But this guy decided that he needed to get us to the airport really quick. Uh, I don't know if there was that much of a rush or not. But here he is driving through the traffic, like this, and over in his hand over here, he's, he's doing the beads. <laughs> They're going to have some insurance. Yeah. Uh, you know, we weren't sure whether we should look at the road or look at him or look at the beads. <laughs> and he was going through those beads. He was going through, wow. Well, when Christians in our day decide to sin intentionally, what do they think the penalty will be? Going to the confessional, getting caught, ooh, dear, risking some extra time in purgatory, or just accepting the blood. And you remember there was a famous evangelist who got caught yes. committing adultery, and he said, don't worry, I sinned under the blood. Yeah, he's still in business now. Well, are there any sins, are there any risks in sinning under the blood? Well, these people knew about the blood, didn't they? Yeah. With all those sacrifices. If you believe in predestination, let's take another group of Christians. If you believe in predestination, what do you say to yourself if you choose to sin? What do the predestinarians say? Before you're born, you're, your destiny is already fixed, right? Yeah. So that means... If you're already saved... Yeah, you cannot be unsaved. cannot be unsaved. And if you're already lost, what difference yes. does it make? So they have no interest in uh, evangelism. Yeah. It's just, uh, you know, the die is cast and, and you, yeah. you play your role. They, they do not have to struggle with the question of, am I doing what is right? Because it is right, because it doesn't make any difference. Did the people living in Israel and Judah in Isaiah's day really believe that it was all right to engage in fertility cult worship so long as they returned to the temple and offered their offerings to God or asked for his forgiveness? That's paganism. Uh, they've done just about everything else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that section you read, is this a result of having a perceived contractual co covenant with God? Do we sometimes say to God, if you will do this for me, I will do that for you. Well, do we ever do yeah, that? Bargaining. Uh. <laughs> Is it all right to sin if you're willing to go through the necessary steps to return to God? I can never, I never forget uh, the first place we lived in Africa. And you might get tired of my using my African illustrations, but they fit so well sometimes. And there were young men who and you understand all the issues here, the, you had to pay a, a dowry to get a wife. And some of the dowries were pretty expensive. But if you could get a girl pregnant, the cost of the dowry would go down. Now she's contaminated, right? Yeah. Like this. So the cost of the dowry would go down. But then, if you're a Christian, you would get thrown out of church. So the question is, is it worth it to have to go through the whole baptismal ceremony again and go to Sabbath extra, extra time in, in church for like a, a, at least a year, maybe two years, to go through the whole ceremony once again to get this girl you want and that whole process. They literally, some of them, 
sat down, okay, is it worth it to do this? Yeah. Do we ever think to ourselves, I've been very faithful in church attendance so far this year, and my tithes and offerings are paid up. I'm even contributing to the church building fund. Give me a little slack here, God. Is our relationship with God based on keeping scores? Yeah, Thinking and reasoning provide the building blocks for a new heart that God offers to us. Without them, no progress is made. Is this rationalism? Are we placing our own thoughts and minds above the revelation of God? Not at all. It is just that our minds are the only instrument we have for understanding and knowing God. More than that, when we enter into a dialogue with God, He gives us thoughts that we may have never thought of before. This is not mere human, no mere human effort. Contrast what happened in the French Revolution when they deified human reason. Was there anything rational about what they did? Nope. <laughs> they still called it the goddess of reason. There was nothing sensible about that whole process. Well, let's take, let's take a simpler question. Why does God describe sins as red? Maybe it was because red is the color of the blood or blood guilt that covered the hands of the, of the people in Isaiah 1.15. By contrast, white has always been regarded by people as being pure and clean. Psalm 51, 7 and 14, for example. Well, God offers to sweep away our sins if we will just come back and live according to His plan of blessing for our lives. God was, is, yearning for them, us, to come back. Compare Hosea's appeal to the northern kingdom of Israel during Isaiah's ministry. Yep. Hosea 11. Beautiful, famous words. Hosea 11, 8. How can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma? Okay, I'm going to stop here for a second. Then it mentions a neckline, Zeboim. So you biblical scholars, tell me about Adma and Zeboim. Two, at the same time as Sodom and Gomorrah. There were two little towns located just around oh. Sodom and Gomorrah that were basically the same, the same kind of stuff and they were destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, go ahead, Charles. My heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. And let me emphasize, these words of Hosea were being spoken to the northern kingdom at the same time as Isaiah. They were contemporaries. Mm -hmm. So imagine God saying this to those evil people in the northern kingdom while Isaiah is trying to speak to the people in the southern kingdom at the same time. And what is it that God ultimately wants, us, wants of us? Well, these are the famous words of Jeremiah 31, and I hope you all are very familiar with them. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizens to know the Lord, <clears throat> because all will know me, from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins, and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Okay, now I'm going to ask you a question. Why would God say, I will no longer remember their wrongs? That's, that's, that's a strange thing to say, isn't it? He doesn't have, have a record keeping that he's concerned with. It's not... He has a record. I mean, we know that he has a record. There's lots of verses in the Bible that say that. But it's, it's not something he has to refer to. Exactly. And it's, it's, he, he, he just assumed, put it, remember, the, put it into the depths of the sea. Yeah. Let bygones be bygones. You know? yeah. let's, let's learn some more. So what you're saying then is that God says, if you'll just come back to me, whatever evil things you did in the past don't matter anymore. That's right. They do not matter. It's not a question of did you do them or didn't you do them or, or have you paid for them or whatever other variation you want. No, the, the point is that God says, if you just come back to me, it doesn't matter what happened before. So what are our options? Isaiah 9. Excuse me, Isaiah 1, 19 to 20. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. 
But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The Holy Bible, Revised Standard Version, 1989. Okay, think about this now. Was God suggesting that you either eat or be eaten? Isn't that what it sort of suggests there? If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land, right? But if you refuse and uh, rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. Isn't that to be eaten? So eat or be eaten. Which do you want? Are we willing to obey God? Or will we allow sin to destroy us? This was a conditioned, conditional promise to the children of Israel. Did they want blessings or curses? I mean, okay. What do you want? Blessings or curses? Blessings, curses. And we're not talking about some other human being that might have wanted to do you in some way or another. We're talking about the God of the universe who has your life, your eternal welfare in his hands. So what do you want? Blessings or curses? In essence, this is a repetition of the word of God through Moses as recorded in Deuteronomy 30, 19 to 20. And you know about that Deut Deuteronomy is just a recording basically of those three final sermons that Moses gave down there on the plains of Moab looking across the river Jordan they could see Jericho over there they knew that was going to be their first uh, opponent when they got across the river and Moses is saying get ready this is what you need to do this is how you need to do to prepare yourself Carrie. I'm reading from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 to 20. I am now giving you the choice between life and death, between God's blessing and God's curse. And I call heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Choose life. Love the Lord your God, obey him and be faithful to him. And then you and your descendants will live long in the land that he promised to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's from the Good News Bible. Is it really true that there is no middle ground, no compromise between God and sin? Are there really only these, those two extremes? It's interesting to notice that the original covenant given by God to Moses, as recorded in Deuteronomy 27 through 30, follows the exact elements of covenant agreements used by other nations in Moses' day. What were those elements? One, the recounting of what God had already done for them. Two, the conditions or stipulations or commandments to be observed in order for the covenant to be maintained. Three, reference to witnesses. And four, blessings and curses to warn people what would happen if they violated the covenant conditions. And that's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, December 30. So, I read Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. What does it tell us? Listen while I sing you this song. The song of my friend and his vineyard. My friend had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug the soil and cleared it of stones. He planted the finest vines. He built a tower to guard them. Dug up, no, dug a pit for treading the grapes. He waited for the grapes to ripen, but every grape was sour. So now, my friend says, you people who live in Jerusalem and Judah, judge between my vineyard and me. Is there anything I failed to do for it? And why did it produce sour grapes and not the good grapes I expected? This is what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge round it, break down the wall that protects it, and let wild animals eat it and trample it down. I will let it be overgrown with weeds. I will not prune the vines or hoe the ground. Instead, I will, let it, I will let briars and thorns cover it. I will even forbid the clouds to let rain fall on it. Israel is the vineyard of the Lord Almighty. The people of Judah are the vines he planted. He expected them to do what was good, but instead they committed murder. He expected them to do what was right, right rather, but their victims cried out for justice. Again, from the Good News Bible. Okay, now, 
we'll see how good your short-term memory is. Do you remember what the, some of the things that we read about there in 2 Kings 17? Some of the really bad things they did. They turned to all the pagan sacrifices. They offered the offerings to the pagan sacrifices. They even offered their own children those pagan every altars. Every shady tree. Every shady tree in the top hill. of every green hill. There were, there were monuments put up to these pagan... I mean, imagine, I mean, it's almost as bad as what we have. I mean, us here? We have a, how, how many houses have televisions? How many, how, you know, how many places have TV program? I mean, cinemas to go to and so forth and so forth. Yeah. Uh, the, but it seems like right after this, for 600 years, there was nothing going on before Christ came. Yeah. Yeah. But you and I need to believe perhaps that there were still a handful of people who stayed faithful. Well, what's amazing, what's amazing, the northern king of Israel went through this whole process while Isaiah and Hezekiah and the others were looking on from Jerusalem about 700 B.C. And 722, 7, 723, 722 B.C., that northern king was finally conquered by the Assyrians and wiped out. The, those crazy words that uh, Carrie read for us. But then, remember the last paragraph says, but the children of Judah were doing the same thing. Same. And so about 110 years later, the same thing in, to the northern kingdom it was Assyria. To the southern kingdom later it was Babylon. Same story. Exactly. And so... What came? What do we know about who came, uh, in light of what you just said, who came out of that southern kingdom of Judah at the time it was in downfall that was a sparkling, shining contradiction to that whole thing? Who grew up in that environment and still was a faithful messenger of God? Was it Isaiah Perfect. or Daniel? Daniel. Daniel. Yeah. Okay. Daniel and his Daniel. three friends. Yeah. They grew up. They were contemporaries to Isaiah. They were contemporaries to Ezekiel and so forth. All at the same time that the southern kingdom of Judah was going through what the northern, the northern kingdom of Israel went through as we're as we're studying about right now. This is good. You brought this up. This is beautiful. Amazing that there's here's three young men that absolutely would not compromise with evil for anything. Mm. And they grew up, I mean, it's like finding a beautiful white lily coming out of a cesspool. And what a witness. Yeah. Uh, the Daniel chapter 4 is written by the mightiest king yep. of the earth at that time. Well, what we know is that God used a parable to get the people to see themselves as they really were. It is analogous to his approach to the King David when he sent the prophet Nathan to him. And you know the story in 2 Samuel 12, 1 to 13. Remember when Nathan showed up and what did, he, what did he say to David? There was a man, poor man, who lived near the rich man and he had one lamb. <laughs> and he slept with the lamb and he gathered his family and his ram. And the rich man had a visitor who came to see him. And the rich man said, I don't want to kill one of my animals. He went and took that animal from that poor man and killed it for his, for his visitor. Oh, David was mad. This and one. He was, yeah. He said, he got to pay back four times. Right. And then Nathan said, you are, you are the, man. the man. But the beauty is the, is the repentance. The, yeah. The, the, uh, I, uh, Psalms 51. Yeah. How beautiful. And 32 as well. Yeah. Two psalms. So why did, call, why did God call this a love song? After all, does he said about what was going on? As we know from the history of the Old Testament, God appealed to the children of Israel again and again. But they would wander away from him and get into all sorts of trouble. Then they would ask, but, 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 but when they were in trouble, where's God? Does that sound familiar? Yeah. And then they would go back to him. And they would try to worship him again. And he would bless them again until they started wandering away again. And if you want to pick a typical place, 
Look at Judges 2 and 3. And it was just one time after another, up and down, up and down, up and down, just a couple chapters there, back in the days of the Judges. And why was God so patient with his chosen people? Second Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he's patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. If you have a child that's gone to, to rebellion, do you kick them out and throw dirt on them, and, or do you still love them? Still, still love them. You still love them. But God must finally recognize that those who are running away from him as fast as they can go must be allowed their freedom. And unfortunately, they will reap the consequences of what they have chosen for themselves. And there's these very fateful words clear at the very end of the Bible, Revelation 22:11: Whoever is evil must go on doing evil, and whoever is filthy must go on being filthy. But whoever is good must go on doing good, and whoever is holy must, going on, must go on being holy. Wow. God has chosen to work with us through the Holy Spirit. Since Jesus is no longer present on this earth, on this earth as a human being, he chooses, he chooses to work through the Holy Spirit, who, because of his omnipresence, can work with each one of us no matter where we are. But what happens if we reject God's only means of reaching out to us? Matthew 12, 31 and 32. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> and so I tell you that people can be forgiven any sin and any evil thing they say. But whoever says evil things against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who says something against the Son of Man can be forgiven. But whoever says something against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven now or ever. Is that a, a, means you, you shut off, you don't want to listen. Yeah. Okay? And what, what's, what's God, God going to do? God just, says, okay, this is the way I want to communicate with you. This is a, the, the, the message I have. Yeah, a marvelous message I've given, and the Holy Spirit's here to, to administer that in whatever way is, is appropriate. And if you, if you say no, 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 what's God going to do? All he can do is honor your choice, yeah. and he can't pummel you into submission. Well, he can't do that and still maintain your freedom. Well, that's, allow you yeah. to have your freedom. Yeah. yeah. Because God is love. And what happens if we turn away from God and keep running away from him? Carrie? Reading from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. For how can those who abandon their faith be brought back to repent again? They were once in God's light. They tasted heaven's gift and received their share of the Holy Spirit. They knew from experience that God's word is good, and they had felt the powers of the coming age. And then they abandoned their faith. It is impossible to bring them back to repent again because they are again crucifying the Son of God and exposing him to public shame. Okay. Go ahead, from the Good News Bible. Yeah. But I want to I want to point this out. Some people look at that and say, well, you know, it, it's hopeless. There's not a chance. If, if we, we sin, we once joined the church, and then we sin, boy, this is... No, what this is saying, if you understand the original Greek, it says, if you keep on making, shaming God and keep on uh, exposing him to public shame and keep on denying, uh, crucifying, in effect, the Son of God. You keep on doing it, you keep on doing it, you keep on doing it. What is God supposed to do? Yes. I mean, would you like to admit somebody like that to heaven, let him see if he can crucify Jesus again? I mean, what, <laughs> what's God going to do? He's got to let you go the way you've chosen. If you take a careful look at the cross and realize all Jesus did through his life and death, how could we ignore such an appeal from heaven? God lays out a very simple proposition. We can choose to follow the example of Jesus as far as possible and live eternally, 
or we choose to ignore his appeals, continue our sins, and die the death that Jesus died. He didn't die of blood loss or being crucified. He died of separation from God. That's what we call the second death. Remember, Romans 6.23 says, sin pays its wage. What's the wage? Death. Death. It's not God doing it. No, it's not God doing it. Charles? The prophet's people of God had separated from God and had lost their wisdom and perverted their understanding. They could not see afar off, for they had forgotten that they had been purged from their old sins. They moved restlessly and uncertainly under darkness, seeking to ob obliterate from their minds and the memory of the freedom, assurance, and happiness of their former estate. They plunged into all kinds of presumptuous, foolhardy madness, placed themselves in opposition to the providences of God, and depended on the on guilt deepened. and depend the guilt that was already upon them. And let me interrupt there for a second. So what is what is what is Ellen White saying here? These people have started down this route, worshiping the fertility cult gods, carrying on these all these horrific practices, and what are they doing? There's like jumping from the fire into uh, from the frying pan into the fire they, they 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 have they don't have no interest in coming back there's no they, they don't seem to care about god at all there they, they're putting in their their bid on sabbath morning maybe at the, at the synagogue or at the, at the temple okay god yeah okay fine i did it okay well I'm, I'm gone now i'm off i have other things to do i mean what kind of religion is that yeah okay go ahead they, they listened listen to the charges of Satan against the divine character <clears throat> and represented God as devoid of mercy and forgiveness. Ellen White, Review and Herald, August 6, 1895, paragraph 11. So she wrote that from where, Carrie, do you remember? Australia. Australia. <laughs> yes, 1895, written from Australia. Australia or New Zealand. God chooses to work with any one of us who is willing to listen to him. Jim, does that sound familiar? Sure it is. We do not transform ourselves. We cannot do that. We can only open our minds and our hearts to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and make the changes as we allow him to do so. We don't change ourselves. We don't have the power to change ourselves. We just allow God the opportunity to come in. God, Come on in. I, I'm, I'm studying my Bible. I'm praying. I'm thinking about you. I'm meditating and so forth. Come and make the changes that need to be made. Think about the relationship between Isaiah's prophecy of the vineyard and Isaiah 5, 1 to 7 that we just read a moment ago and the exp expansion of that Jesus made, of the, the expansion that Jesus made of that story is recorded in Matthew 21, 33 to 45, Mark 12, 1 to 12, and Luke 20, 9 to 19. So where are we in our relationship with God? What is the relationship between the forgiveness God offers and the transformation that accomplishes uh, that accomplishes in I'm sorry, lives. and the transformation He accomplishes in our lives? Sorry, I had a little glare on my screen here and I missed the word there. Which comes first, transformation and then forgiveness or forgiveness and then transformation? And why is it important to know which comes first? That's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Friday, January 1. So what about that? What do you think comes first? The forgiveness or the transformation? Well, everybody's forgiven, so that comes first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and who's responsible on both sides? Who forgives and who transforms? Well, the question, though, is how does he do it? He can't force you, it no. to you. All he can do is, if you're willing to listen and take it's it's what the old through the Old Testament, and the, is listen. So why do so many of God's children choose to ignore His directions and follow their own selfish ways instead? Scan over Isaiah one to five when you have an opportunity. 
These five chapters serve as a kind of introduction to all the book of Isaiah. They point out that Ju Judah's relationship with God had been corrupted. They had repeatedly turned away from God to their own ways. So God appealed to them. What more could he possibly have done that he, that he had not done? He refuses to violate our freedom. If God had simply stepped away from them and abandoned them, they all would have what? Died. Died. He is the only source of life. An example of that is, I mean, that's, it's spelled out quite clearly in Acts 17 and, and a couple, one of in Paul's sermons there. So we see in this lesson three main sections. One, the word of God to Isaiah, and he repeatedly says, uh, the Lord has spoken, da-da-da. Two, a terrible picture of, that, of their sinful nation. And three, God's invitation to come back and discuss issues and think about what they were doing. And that, of course, in involves what we know as thinking. Thinking. Amazing, right? Isaiah is known for his repeatedly writing, the Lord has spoken, or similar words. As a young man, Isaiah wanted the people to understand that he was not speaking on his own behalf or from some other human perspective. He was giving them what? The, the word, word of God. God. Do these messages from Isaiah to the people of Judah uh, about 700 years before the time of Jesus Christ have anything to do with us in the 21st century? Well, Isaiah repeatedly appealed to them using the name Yahweh, which is the personal name of God, trying to get them to take God seriously. Well, in this fir these first chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah used several words to describe the sins of the people of Judea. The first word was Pasha, describing a sinful act. Uh, or a rebellion, a revolt. This act was considered to be criminal behavior or treason in the Hebrew Bible. In Isaiah 1, 4, he used the word hata, which when combined with the word describing the people can, can be translated people who have missed the goal or who are at fault or who offend others committing a sin and being guilty. That's from uh, a famous lexicon. Uh, a third word, awon, was used to describe an activity that is crooked or wrong. Isaiah went on to say that their behavior was corrupt and backward. They had abandoned the Lord, were living in a rebellion with bad behavior, wrong acts, and guilt. In fact, they were worse than oxen or donkeys, but God did not say, I am I'm abandoning you, abandoning you forever, and we run out of time. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for this lesson from Isaiah and surely all the lessons that will follow. So much of what Isaiah had to say would be appropriate in our day. May it be so is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.